Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Planning Board and the City Council Committee on Legislative Matters. Um, I'm Alex Jarrett and I'll be the chair. Uh, George Kohout and I have discussed and agreed that I will chair uh, the public hearing <clears throat> today uh, for both um, bodies. Um, this is the August 8th meeting and um, Laura, would you call the roll? Sure. I'm Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Mm, pretty sure I saw her, Councillor Elkins. Maybe she stepped away for the moment. Okay, Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. One more try for Councillor Elkins. She'll probably be joining in a few minutes. Do you want me to call the roll for planning? Or? We, we normally don't do that, Laura, um, sure. but it's not one of our procedures. So I'm not sure why, but uh, we are who we are being recorded, so. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, so this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, <clears throat> next, we'll have public comment for items that aren't on the agenda. Is there anyone from the public would like to comment on an item. I don't see any one uh, or hands. Um, so we'll move to the uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, this is the fe our February 14th, 2022 meeting. And um, could I have a motion for approval? I'll move for approval. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Still not present. Um, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that brings us to uh, the public hearing on proposed zoning change on proposed zoning change. Um, and oh, uh, also uh, just a reminder that I am happy to be, for us to refer to each other by first names, uh, unless anyone would prefer otherwise. Uh, so we are, this is 22.141, an ordinance to amend the zoning map 350-3.4 on Bridge Road and Cook Avenue. This was referred to the planning board and legislative matters on July 14th. I'm sorry. Oh, welcome, Marissa. I'm sorry. I got a call just as it was uh, the meeting was starting and I had to take it. I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, the public hearing notice was published July 25th and August 1st in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Uh, so if for our body, we do need to uh, a vote to open the public hearing. Um, so I would be happy to entertain such motion. I'll make a motion uh, to, open, to open the public second. hearing. Okay, motion made by Jim and seconded by Stan. Laura, roll call please on opening the public hearing. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And I believe the planning board doesn't need to do such a, a roll call. Yep. I recall from previous meetings. Okay. So um, we will first hear from proponents. And just a reminder that, you know, this is an open public hearing. It is our opportunity to hear from the public and from city staff, staff and to ask questions. And once we close the hearing, um, then we will deliberate on our recommendations. Um, Carolyn Mish from the planning department, would you like to speak to this? I would, thank you. Um, and so Laura, if you could put the map up, that would be great. This is an ordinance amendment to create an overlay district, um, what's referred to as a 40 r district or um, smart growth overlay. The smart growth, um, and 40 R provisions under um, state statute are really um, 
a tool, an incentive um, that was adopted by the state to encourage um, housing and housing of all types really um, throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but in particular, affordable housing, and because there are bonus payments for um, to the city for all the affordable housing units that would be constructed within a designated 40R or smart growth overlay district. Um, you've seen many, several of these amendments over the years. The first 40R district was created as an overlay at the state hospital and the city has received payments um, through this, over several years from the state for those units. In this case, um, we're proposing, so the city now has two um, categories of overlay districts. One is Smart Growth Overlay Village Hill, and the other one is Urban Residential. And the Urban Residential Overlay is the one that's in front of you tonight. We have um, an overlay possible on um, in the urban um, residential districts is sort of that's where we came up with the name. There was a, there was an overlay created for one parcel, and, um, and that was also a Valley CDC parcel on Bridge Street um, next to Historic Northampton, um, or two doors down from Historic Northampton. And this would be an expansion of that district, and it's connected, believe it or not, through an area of concentrated development. And that's sort of what the state defines is sort of there's corridor up King Street is that area considered a concentrated development. And so these two overlays um, are proposed to um, be associated with that district and that associated uh, commercial development or concentrated development, I should say. Um, the whole idea behind this is really to um, um, take advantage of the state's incentive for affordable housing and thereby um, utilize um, any um, bonus payments and then um, unit um, payment distribution from the state for each of the affordable housing units that we know will be developed at these locations. And the underlying zoning uh, essentially stays the same. So, and, and just so you know, the state first has to approve your application We've submitted this, I think, back in April or May to the state, and we still haven't heard confirmation. They send um, a the, the response that is in writing from the state, and they send a formal agreement to the city about the terms of the overlay. We have not received that yet, and um, I, I will. Um, I've been trying to get that information back, but the, the bottom line is before city council can make um, a final vote on this um, district, the state has to send that approval letter. So we can go through the public hearing process and so forth, but it can't go back to city council for a vote until we get that information from the state. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, does anyone have questions for Carolyn? Jim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Carolyn, could you explain that again? So were the, the approval process and the timing, how what we're doing right now is we're on track to send something to council, but we don't wanna vote on it until the state's approved it. So we're anticipating the state to approve this moving forward soon. Is that, we're, we're trying to time up, line up the timing of things. Exactly. So this happened, this has happened several times. Actually, almost every time we've expanded the district, it's taken a little bit longer for the state to give us the information, the notice, essentially notice to proceed. Um, right. Then we have been, you know, we've gone faster than they have. Um, I think the last one was Laurel Street. And we, I think we even had to put off um, the council vote the first time because we had not gotten the letter from the state. Mm -hmm. and, and we're comfortable that the state will respond in time before the, what is it, we have 90 days or something that from the public hearing? 
Um, yes, the 90 days I'm not um, concerned about. We've we had preliminary conversations with the folks at uh, Department of Housing and Community Development about this, so it's not a, it wasn't a surprise. In fact, we worked back and forth um, looking at the maps and the numbers. Um, so it's it's um, just a matter of timing. I don't I I don't think we'll have a problem with the 90 days. Okay. I, I have an additional question, and so um, that can you explain the difference between this and how, how these particular overlays are not considered spot zoning? Because they, in, in some ways, they could look that way, but they're. Can you explain that for us? Sure. So the underlying zoning is not changing. This is on top of what underneath and it, it allows additional density um, from what's in the underlying zone. And um, because it's an overlay and not changing the baseline zoning, then it's not considered spot zoning. And the only way you can meet that is by connecting it, essentially connecting the dots to the other part of the district through this area of concentrated development. And so we sent documentation to the state about how it's connected to that King Street corridor, you know, in, in half right. a mile or something like that. So. Right, right. Okay. Thank you. George. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, I was wondering when you kept saying the state, who exactly the state was, but it's DHCD, right? Yeah. Yes. The state. Um, right. And, and the, uh, the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth. The only downside to this, Carolyn, I think, if, if in fact, for some bizarre reason, the overlay distance were accepted, Valley CBC still could go forward with their application, right? It's all really about uh, the city getting these bonus payments. Okay. Uh, they exactly. Still, it's the same application process for Valley CBC, regardless of this new overlay district. Right. So it's the same site plan, essentially this site plan review process. Um, and we just copied and pasted that those requirements into the 40R submittal requirements. And so the same, the review is the same. Um, and it really is just about establishing the district so that then the city is eligible for those um, bonus payments. I have a question, Carolyn. Um, if the state says one is okay and not the other, would we then just amend the order? Uh, yeah. Or the change, rather? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Other questions for Carolyn? Stan. Thank you. Um, I, I just preface my question by, by saying that both these projects are in mm -hmm. Ward 1, and I appreciate the forward thinking uh, about this district, the overlay district and, and support it. Um, at the, when this was introduced to the council in July, I believe it was Alex who raised the, uh, the question about the possibility of the lack of sidewalks on, on Cook Avenue being a, a potential uh, impediment. I, you know, and I continue to get uh, uh, concerns expressed to me by residents of that neighborhood about uh, adding sidewalks on Cook Avenue. I wondered, Carolyn, if you have any additional information about that at this point. Um, I, I do not. However, I um, will say, I mean, there, there, there certainly are um, gaps in the sidewalk in that whole area. Um, and the DOT is planning for sidewalk extension from Cook Avenue to um, Route, Route 5, King Street, not King Street, um, to the proposed roundabout area as part of that project. So that would close that gap. Um, we have used almost entirely, I think, actually 100% of the incentive payments so far have been used for traffic mitigation. Um, in the downtown and surrounding areas. So um, I don't know that we would um, 
you can pledge at this point that it would we'd expand the location of these intent of the use of the incentive payments. But you know, the city also has a prioritization of where sidewalks go. And so we also need to be um, mindful of that and not sort of jump the line in terms of evaluating where the needs are for sidewalks. But um, we definitely know about the, and that may be one of the issues that um, DHCD highlights in its evaluation of this one particular parcel at the end of Cook Avenue, not the Bridge Road one, because there are sidewalks there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? David? Yeah, uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something here. I don't understand. We're rezoning something because we know it, somebody wants to build something. I, I don't understand why are we not like, why not all of Cook Avenue? Why not Emily Lane? Like why these two? Just because there's someone who wants to do a project there? Like, I understand it's not spot zoning, like by the letter of the law, but like de facto it is basically because I mean I don't I don't get it. Like they're they're allowed, they can change their pro forma to account for the like well I don't know what their costs and costs to the project are, but something seems really odd, honestly, to to me about this. And I just maybe I just don't know the history or like some details of why we're doing these two parcels and not others. It's, um, it's truly not changing the underlying zoning, like, then yeah. why just these? Um, so I think part of it, the part, the part of the answer is that the overlay does allow an in, um, so there are two parts of the answer. One is there's a specific formula um, that is applicable when you um, submit to the state on whether or not you'd be eligible for um, incentive payments. And so if you have a huge area where that's not, where you really don't have capacity to build housing units, meaning the lots are already built out fully, um, then, then um, the total there, the state is gonna pay on the difference between what you could build and what this incentive allows. And so you need to show the total acreage that's available for development and the total acreage that's already developed within that and their formula um, comes back and says, well, this is how much you'd be eligible for for units. And so some of it is, I mean, really, you could probably call it gerrymandering, <laughs> um, but so that's part of it is we wanna, and we know that this is gonna happen anyway. So we don't, we'd like not to lose out on the opportunity. The other part of it is, you know, it would take um, quite a bit of undertaking to both do the calculations, like I said, for how much area is developable, but also in terms of a public, um, um, I think it would take a lot of public process to um, apply a large area that's outside of the downtown to this district and explain that it doesn't mean that all of a sudden all these lots are going to, you know, double or triple in density, um, and I think that would be the concern of of residents is that if we're applying this, then we're saying we want all of this land to just sort of um, in increase in density, even though it may there may not be the capacity there to do it. So we've picked the areas that are actually legitimately developable to expand the overlay. I hope other people understand this better than I do. I would note we also have an affordable housing um, zoning change that we made, was it a little over a year ago? That, that allows, <laughs> how, how does that compare in terms of the amount of density that it, it allows, versus, which is applies in which districts? Is it the whole um, city? You are being. It applies in yeah. It applies in this district for sure. It applies in in all districts except for the um, ones where we're not encouraging new housing developments, so the Special Conservancy and the um, Farms, Forest and Rec 
appropriation. Um, um, so that's exactly right. So it's the applicant could move forward um, under the affordable, uh, apply for a site plan for two and a half times the underlying density allowed in a district um, using that provision and site plan. The difference is if we use the state, ver state version, those same residential units could be built, but then the state gets a payment. I mean, the city gets a payment from the Commonwealth for those new units, even though it could also be developed under this affordable housing um, zoning. Right, but by that logic, like all the, all of the lots on Cook Avenue are underbuilt by that logic, like it's all developable. Um, potentially for affordable housing. Yeah. And that already exists. Uh, right. That's my understanding. And so the, right. the difference here, in my understanding, is if we do this, we get the incentive payment. We are not really changing anything about what is uh, able to be built in in these districts. Is that correct? If you're just focused on affordable housing unit, that is correct. And if, if we weren't, would there be something that this overlay gives us that uh, wouldn't otherwise? Uh, so, so in the overlay, the density is allowed to occur, but the city doesn't receive payments for the uh, units that are not permanently or have a, a restriction, a 30, at least a 30 year restriction on them. So um, in, uh, um, so you could still build the units out with a 40 r overlay with the affordable housing um, provision that sort of local 40 B that was adopted a year ago, you could get a mix of affordable and market rate units. Um, but 50% of any unit, 50% of the total units built on a parcel would have to be deed restricted um, to meet um, the affordability standards. And also, as we mentioned before, they're not, because it's, an, it, it's not in the 40 hour overlay, there wouldn't be that incentive payment. So every time we catch wind that an affordable housing project is underway, should we be like jumping the gun and changing the zoning before they apply for a, a site plan approval or, or go through the process so we can get more city payments? Is that what I'm hearing? Um, well, the state set it up as a, a res, as housing incentive, a housing incentive program. So essentially, um, yes, it might make sense to do this, particularly when it's in an area of concentrated development, and it meets the state criteria for that. But it wouldn't necessarily be everywhere. Does, does the size of the project have any relevance to? being eligible for this overlay? No, as I mentioned, the, there's one tiny parcel on Bridge Street that was approved. And it was less than a quarter of an acre, I think. So we have an affordable housing bonus across all of the urban residential zones now, right? Yes. But this changes it so there's actually no, there's no formula for the density allowed it's actually just it's removing all zoning restrictions and we just have to go through site plan approval is that how i understand it no the 40r zoning uh the 40r provisions um in the code mirror what site plan approval so it's the same review process it's just called 40r instead of site plan and they'll the applicant would get a 40r permit then we record that with the Commonwealth and record how many units ultimately receive a certificate of occupancy that are deed restricted for affordability and, and track those units. The, the payments from the state when the city accrues them over time, do they go back towards uh, the mission of affordability? affordable housing no. or it just goes into the general fund? 
It goes into the general fund, except that I will say that the whole point of the payment is to help offset the potential impacts of new housing in different districts. And so the way that we've interpreted and used that is with new housing, you get new increased potential increase in traffic and um, and the need to mitigate for those increased trips. And so, so far the city has, um, and the, the mayor has um, allocated a previous mayor and current mayor, I believe is it will continue that as far as I know, applied it to um, design upgrades. In fact, most of that money has gone to picture Main Street project and um, safety improvements and design leading into Main Street because most of that money came from the state hospital um, build out. Other questions? Well, uh, I'd like to open it up to other members of the public now. I see we have Jessica Allen from the Valley CDC here. Um, would you be like to speak to this, Jessica? Uh, I mean, nothing really specifically. Uh, we're in support of it. Anything that any municipality can do to help our permitting process run a little bit smoother really helps our development process and helps us to get units online quicker. So we're grateful for anything that the city can do to, to expedite a uh, permitting process for us. Um, the city is above and beyond what most municipalities do in terms of their zoning for this type of work. So we're really appreciative for them to even consider this right now. Thank you. If, if you have any questions about the project itself, I'm happy to answer that, like, you know, number of units and that, but I, I think everybody's fairly familiar with it. I have, a question. I have a question about what you just said. So in what way does this make your permitting process more expedited? So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, Carolyn had mentioned that it's a site plan review process. And so that's a, a fairly quick process anyway. Um, when I initially looked at the zoning, it looked like it was a special permit process. So for me, anything that's a special permit process is, is difficult. Um, for us, I mean, we have to abide by design guidelines under the 40R. I think that the 40R program really is this great carrot and stick approach for both municipalities and for developers. It allows us to have a by right use and it gives the municipality the ability to have some design guidelines set into place and to receive incentive payments. So, um, you know, for us, I think anytime we can do anything quickly and expeditiously, it really helps us. For us, we're applying for financing for this project um, this coming year, and we need to have permits in hand um, by the fall in order to apply for that funding. So um, what I'm, I'm hearing that's a little concerning to me is in terms of the, the letter from the state, but it doesn't sound like that's going to impede our permitting process. It seems like it's gonna be, it's gonna be quick either way. Um, most municipalities aren't as um, uh, gracious with site plan approval when it comes to affordable housing. They tend to make it a lot more difficult. So 40R really is, it helps us in most municipalities. To me, it sounds like this is a huge benefit more for the city than it is for the development team because we can, we're able to do this anyway in a pretty expeditious permitting process. Thank you, Jessica. Other questions? Okay. Um, I don't see anyone else from the public who might like to speak to this. So uh, it sounds like it's time to um, entertain a motion to close the public hearing for both bodies unless anyone else has anything they'd like to ask. Okay, could I have a motion from Legislative Matters? I'll move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Okay, a motion made by Stan, and uh, I'll give that to Marissa for the second uh, to close the public hearing. Any discussion on closing the public hearing? Roll call, please. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, and would the planning board like to make a motion to close the public hearing? 
I'll make a motion to close, close the public hearing. Second. Okay, motion made by Melissa and seconded by David. Any discussion? Um, I'm not sure who, does Laura do the roll call or Carolyn? Um, usually mm -hmm. George does. Usually, oh, usually George does. does. So we'll go that route. Okay. Um, so the motion's been made, um, no discussion. Um, all those, uh, we'll start with Melissa. Yes. And Jana. Yes. And David. Yep. And George votes yes also. Unanimous. Okay, the public hearing is closed. Um, <clears throat> would, would anyone like to make a motion for a recommendation? I'd move that we, uh, legislative matters, uh, puts this forward to the council when it's time with a positive recommendation. Second. A motion made by Marissa and seconded by Stan for a positive recommendation. And do we need one as well from the planning board before we discuss? Okay. Uh, I'll move that we uh, recommend to approve the motion. Did I say that right? Usually we do something Second that. The, uh, recommend to approve the amendment, I guess I should say. Yeah. Okay. Um, the motion made by David and seconded by Melissa. Okay, discussion. I, I think this, is, this, this seems to make a lot of sense. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that we have like, I love that we have a close relationship with certain affordable housing developers. That's a great thing. What I don't like is that like, what if there's some other person who we don't know who is an affordable housing developer who wants to do something on a nearby site and doesn't know that we're so good to work with that we'll change the zoning to make it easier or go through an easier permit process. I, I don't like the, the fogginess of this. Um, that like, if it's a good thing and it doesn't change the underlying zoning, let's just like, do it more places <laughs> and you know i don't know it seems odd to me but i i can't say i hate there's not anything wrong with doing it here well david to answer part of your question i think any developer who is interested in doing affordable housing of, of a small scale or larger scale is first going to meet with the planning office Carolyn specifically who will probably let them know of all the the benefits and the enhancements that they're that's available to them such as this one um because the city is open arms you know to, to affordable housing so um i don't i don't think there's kind of an inside game to this um and i guess i understood carolyn's um rationale about if we try to extend this overlay to large neighbors on a mass to large neighborhoods in a mass scale there would be so much discussion and so much angst out there in the public about their piece of property or their neighborhood. Um, and that's a process maybe we'd want to go through in the future, but. Um, I mean, we, we just feasibly doubled the zoning for affordable housing and it was not that big a deal. <laughs> I mean, we just did that. I, I mean, I, th I encourage our future planning director to uh, think big. <laughs> <laughs> You're going with me. <laughs> Other questions, uh, comments? I'll weigh in and say I, I think this is this is a good idea. Um, I think that I appreciate David's interest in expanding this, um, but I think that the consequence would be that it would open it to not just affordable housing development to the, this density, um, but that it would open it to a, uh, to, to any kind of, any development, um, if I have that right. And that the, so, um, and the, our current zoning just allows that for affordable housing or a mix, at least 50%. Um, <laughs> So that that would be the concern to expanding it to all. Although I certainly think that's an interest, a thing we could talk about, and that essentially we are doing this so we can get the the incentive payment um, for these particular lots. So that's that's my understanding, and I, I feel comfortable moving this forward. Okay. 
Okay, any other discussion? All right, so for legislative matters, roll call on a positive recommendation. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. And Councilor Fowler, I'm mean, sorry. Um, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Moulton. Did I get him yes. already? Thanks. George for the planning board. So, uh, Melissa, a positive voting on a positive recommendation for the amendment amended ordinance. Yes. And when you're ready for me to be a counselor, just let me know. <laughs> and, and Jana. Yes. David. Yep. And George. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously with both bodies. Um, is there any other business we have before us, Laura? No, I don't see that except for new business. Um, the, the, planning is, board, the planning board could adjourn um, and leave you folks to the new business or gossip, whatever happens. <laughs> sure. <laughs> is there a motion to adjourn the planning board portion of the public hearing? Motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks, Jen. A motion to adjourn at uh, 540, we'll call it. Any discussion? Anybody want to hang around? Okay. Let's go again and we'll start with Melissa. Yes. And Jana. Yes. And David. Yep. And George. Unanimous. All Good right. Thank you, Planning Board. Good to see you all. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any new business? for legislative matters and we would like to see on a future meeting. Okay, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. second. Made by Stan, seconded by Marissa. Uh, roll call. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Thank goodness we're back to the familiar order. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are adjourned. You're Thank adjourned. You for Thank making you. Quick work Welcome back, Laura. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. Okay. Yeah, cool, good folks. to see y'all. Yes. Bye-bye. Good night.